be always acceptable in your sight. The Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A brief word about Edmund and who he was in a way that really helps us look at the context that the gospel and the lessons are addressing. First of all, we're talking about the ninth, ninth century in England. We're talking about the Viking invasions. And what happens is, is that they are tearing, the Vikings are, going from the north, tearing through, burning churches and monasteries, villages, and looting as they go. <coughs> they come upon the kingdom of East Anglia, where Edmund is king. He's a boy king. He was actually made king, uh, like what we would think of as middle school. Mm. By the time of the battle, he was in his early 20s. And what happened was is that they surrounded his village and said, well, you have two choices. Choice number one, you become our vassal under the conditions that all the treasury belongs to us and all of the churches are burned. No Christian worship continues to be allowed, but we'll spare your life and you'll be our puppet. Mm -hmm. Choice number one. Choice number two, you die. The call is yours. There were actually plenty within the church who wanted Edmund to take choice number one. Mm -hmm. Primarily because of the guarantee of the royal lineage. But he refused. They tortured Edmund. They shot him through with arrows, quote unquote, and eventually beheaded him. So we remember good King Edmund today. Now, here's the thing that strikes me as I go through this now. And that is, is that the situation of Edmund sounds a lot like Mosul. Mm. We are all of a sudden no longer in unfamiliar territory. And even the commentaries that I read around 1 Peter and Matthew, which specifically are addressing the issues of Christian persecution, do so, having been written 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago, from a very, very remote armchair perspective, in a way that doesn't address the present fact that we see beheadings on television. Mm. And we know that Christian shrines over 1, 1,500 years old are being completely destroyed, decimated, and entire Christian populations are on the line. So much so that Christianity in the Middle East, which has thrived for over 1,500 years, at least that we know of, is being literally wiped off the face of the planet. Mm. It will no longer exist in those communities at least certainly in the same way that it had. And that those, that isn't actually the only place where this sort of thing is occurring. You could tell similar stories about China, about North Korea, about certain parts of Indonesia, and even in parts of India, where actually not all that long ago, like in the last two weeks, a trumped up charge was railed against a very active Christian couple in India who were burned alive. Um, because of the trumped up charge that they had to face to the Koran. This is now the world in which we live and find ourselves. Uh, not the remote armchair view of persecution taken by most of the Christian commentators. So in the light of that, what does that have to say about us? It seems to me there are two key phrases that are worth pondering in the light of both Edmund and the situation in which we find ourselves. And that has, first of all, the line that is in the first Peter, where when you are being, in essence, faced with your persecutors, he says, don't be afraid, don't be intimidated, but always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting of what the hope that is in you. Christians who live in adversity are probably more than any other group of people, a group of people whose lives are defined by hope. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is this. They know that even if they were to face the worst that life has to offer, 
including all of the things that happened to him, that it is only a passage. That where they eventually go at the invitation of the Lamb who himself was slain and resurrected, was to that, is to that place where there is no pain, where there is no grief, and where God himself wipes away every tear from every eye. So that even if they are to suffer the very worst of torture at the hands of their persecutors, it's small in account, in relationship to what they are about to receive. Mm -hmm. I am convinced, brothers and sisters, what is the scripture? That the suffering of this present time mm -hmm. is not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed <coughs> in us. For them, that is real. So that in the midst of suffering and difficulty, while they pray the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. Should God choose to deliver them through the gate of death, that for them is no loss. And that has everything to do with the hope that is within them. I would urge you this day to ask yourselves what role hope plays in the way that you live your life. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that if that is not a reality for you in very, very concrete ways, you will not be prepared to give an answer demanded from you of the hope that is in you. You will instead sidestep, change the subject, back away, soft pedal your own Christian commitments because you don't want the rejection. You just want to be able to get along and get through your day. And that is exactly the fruit of a weak hope. So number one, think carefully, prayerfully, about what is the strength of the hope that lies within you, about which Peter wrote to a persecuted group of people. The other is this, and the other line is, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, about persecution and them being handed over. And a kind of intolerable situation where they're not only being sought after, rested by the civil courts and by the religious leaders, but even families are betraying each other. I have no idea what it would be like if my wife or one of my sons made the phone call and I got arrested. And that's exactly what he's describing as what will happen. And what does he say if you are in that situation? When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For you will say what will be given to you at the time. For it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. In other words, what Jesus is saying to them is that difficulty itself is a divine appointment. It's not a mistake. It's not all of a sudden me being thrown into a place of feeling like God's protection is far off and that it feels painfully random and without sense. But that this very moment when I am rest arrested and dragged away from my family and stood before the tribunal and they asked me about the faith, he said that will be the very moment when the spirit of your father, and he says father on purpose, father has to do with care, father has to do with divine sovereignty, father has to do with no authority higher. Everything about using that term says, I'm here by divine appointment, God is not absent, in fact just the opposite, this is his divine appointed moment for me, and as a result of that, he will be the one to give me the things to say. Mm. So the question becomes, what do you think of the fatherly care of God for you? What role does that have to play in the way you think about the order of your life, especially in times of difficulty? Especially. 
You see, in many ways, these two lessons become two sides of the same coin. It's an invitation, you see, to us, who at present su suffer very little, if any at all, in the realm of persecution, to see that if our Father is the one who controls all things, and it is the Father's appointment that we live in the hope of eternity, what does life look like living under that kind of care and with that very clear sense of an eternal destination? And that no matter what happens, it is not a mistake. It may not even be an attack of the enemy. But that it is instead a series of divine appointments for which we are prepared. That's the witness of Edmund. That's the wish witness of the Christians in Mosul. That is their word to us. 